you mentioned dementia, and I ain't no scientist, and I can't do math, which is why I'm a writer. <laughs> <laughs> <I was, laughs> Me either. I was on a panel discussion with <clears throat> Dr. Williams last week, and an audience member asked him about dementia. And without being able to quote him verbatim, he said, but look, what we know is Ibogaine has unique and singular neurotherapeutic restoration power. Basically, it regenerates the brain okay. in a way that nothing else does. Okay. Nothing else does what it does. So it's not it does. just a dopamine situation. No. There's more going on. <clears throat> it has a global restorative effect on the organ of the brain the implications of which are profound and require expeditious research, research. and development activity right. in order to maximize all the potentialities uh, in terms of the treatment of neurological disease for which we have no effective answers. As it pertains to Alzheimer's, I would analogize it to what I understand about its application to Parkinson's. For Parkinson's patients, the earlier treatment can be delivered in response to symptom onset, mm. the better the outcome. Of course. It delays right. the progression of symptoms, yes. which lengthens the amount of time a person is going to be able to maintain their functionality. It does not stop or cure the disease but it slows and mitigates symptoms, and that's variable per person. Again, this bears uh, out the necessity for research because there may be ways to engineer Ibogaine so as to maximize those therapeutic benefits over a longer time frame. So if we draw the analogy to Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, it could very well be that when the person starts showing those first signs of forgetfulness, if you start them on an Ibogaine treatment regimen, right. you may be able to arrest the progression of the right. disease of for course. several years to come. Yeah. And I, I have two mothers, the one who gave birth to me and the one who raised me. And You're the one, done. my mother and and my, there's my birth mother, and then there's my father and stepmother. Got it. And okay. I was, I grew so up. So essentially you're adopted. <laughs> I, I grew up primarily with my dad and, and my stepmother. And my stepmother, she uh, fought a valiant battle with a form of metastatic cancer that had a 20% five-year survival rate, and she beat it, only to be failed and afflicted by dementia following the completion of her cancer treatment. And at the age of 71, she passed away this past November, just before Thanksgiving. And let me tell you, Jillian, if I had any notion, belief, or hope that an Ibogaine treatment would have arrested the progression of her disease, there is no prison sentence stiff enough that would have deterred me from doing everything I could to deliver it to her so that she could have the opportunity to be restored. And this gets back to the grotesque reality of U.S. Special Forces veterans, or any veteran for that matter, who signed up with a willingness to lay their life down for this country, the land of the free, where they have been met with a system that is compl oftentimes completely ineffectual in its response to their trauma and their pain. The fact that they have to leave the country that they were ready to die for in order to be restored from the wounds of war that they engaged in for this country's sake is the height of immorality. And the days in which folks have to travel across the border to receive a therapeutic option that delivers a uniquely restorative result need to come to an end sooner rather than later. All right, you you have alluded to this part of our conversation, obviously throughout the conversation. So let's go there and I'll circle back to other questions on protocol and follow up and so on and so forth. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the podcast, please like, comment, subscribe, and share. And make sure to let me know what guests you wanna see on in the future.